I cover a lot of cold cases on this channel, some of which have been unsolved for decades, but I think this is the oldest case I've ever covered. In fact, I found out about it when I went in search of the oldest cold cases I could possibly find. Let's talk about Marvin Clark, who hasn't been seen or heard from in almost a century. Because this case is so old, some of the details are fuzzy. We do know he was born Marvin Alvin Clark, but even his birth date has been disputed. Some sources said he was born in 1857 and others said 1851. We do know he married a woman named Mary and he had four children. Marvin had several different jobs throughout the course of his life. He was a farmer at one point as well as a town marshal, once in Nebraska and later in Linton, Oregon. The word marshal has several different definitions. It can be used to describe the chief of police or of a fire department, a military officer, a court officer, or several other things. However, another source said Clark was a retired sheriff, so I assume that's what it means in his case. By 1926, Marvin and Mary Clark had settled in Tigard, Oregon, about 10 miles south of Portland. They lived there for about 15 years, and at least Marvin was pretty well known. He was in either his late 60s or early 70s, the time when a lot of people today would be preparing for retirement if they weren't there already. I don't know if he was already retired, but an easygoing life from this point would probably not be in the cards for him. On October 30th, 1926, Marvin left his home in Tigard and set off for Portland. Again, sources vary on exactly what his intentions were. Most said he took a stagecoach and went to visit his daughter, Sydney McDougall. Either the next day or two days later, his wife, Mary, contacted Sydney to find out that not only had Marvin never arrived at his daughter's house, but Sydney had no idea he was even supposed to be coming. Other sources give a different story, saying Marvin was going to the doctor and or actually traveled by bus. One source said he also disappeared in June, but I think that was an error. One genealogy website said his movements could be traced to the Yamel Street Terminal in Portland. I don't know exactly how all these details got jumbled up or what the real story is, but Marvin's doctor was reportedly in Portland, so I do wonder if some of these supposed contradictions are actually true at the same time. He could have gone to Portland for a doctor's visit, but also planned to stay with his daughter overnight. Maybe he thought this would be easier than traveling the 10 miles back home the same day, which might have taken longer in 1926 than it would now. But of course, that is just a guess. The search for Marvin started pretty quickly. His family and police were actively looking for him, and police in all Northwest cities were asked to keep an eye out, according to genealogytrails.com. By November, a $100 reward had been set up for information that might lead to his whereabouts. But it was difficult to figure out just what had happened to him. Early on, his family was afraid he'd been hurt or killed by someone he'd made enemies with during his time as marshal. There was also the possibility he'd left on his own, but maybe not intentionally. In early November, Marvin's son Grover received a letter from his father. It was postmarked from Bellingham, Washington, over 200 miles away from Portland. Whatever was in this letter, it led Grover and his wife to believe that Marvin's mind wasn't what it used to be. Marvin also didn't take a coat with him when he set out, even though it was probably pretty cold in Oregon at the end of October. Had something happened to him due to his mental state, or had someone possibly done something to him? Then in 1986, a new theory surfaced. On May 10th, loggers found a skeleton near Scapos, Oregon, about 20 miles north of Portland. Several items were found near the body, but the most notable here were an 1888 nickel and a 1919 penny. A corroded revolver was also found near the body, and the man who had died had a single gunshot wound through his skull. His death was ruled a suicide. A few days later, a woman named Dorothy Willoughby said the body might belong to her grandfather, Marvin Clark. Based on what she'd heard from family members, Marvin had been depressed due to health problems that left him partially paralyzed. 
She knew he hadn't been heard from in years, so it's pretty easy to put the pieces together from here and figure out this theory. The body was also found close to Linton, where Marvin used to serve as town marshal. Linton was later annexed by Portland and is now considered part of it. I believe it's a neighborhood. At the time, the medical examiner said the body appeared to be of a man younger than Marvin had been when he went missing, but there didn't seem to be much progress on identification at the time, presumably at least in part because of a lack of modern technologies like DNA testing. Then in 2004, Dr. Nikki Vance entered the picture. Vance was a forensic anthropologist at the Oregon State Medical Examiner's Office. I'm not sure if she still is. That year, she began looking through the office's unidentified remains. Around 2011, she came across the files both for Marvin Clark and the 1986 John Doe. Wondering if they might be the same person, she sent a DNA profile from the John Doe to the Center for Human Identification at the University of North Texas. Don't ask me exactly how this works, but they were able to get a full DNA profile from this. Now, investigators wanted to get DNA from Marvin Clark. They went through genealogy databases and found some of his relatives from his paternal side who were able to provide DNA. Then they had to get DNA from his maternal side for as full of a profile as possible. However, about six months later, the remains of the 1986 John Doe were confirmed to not be those of Marvin Clark. So is Marvin Clark's case the oldest active missing persons case in the United States? Several sources said it is. Another said it was one of the oldest. Others said something similar and listed a few older cases. Wikipedia says the oldest active case is that of Alice Corbett. Alice was a student at Smith College in Massachusetts and was last seen in her dorm on the morning of November 13, 1925. I know Wikipedia isn't the most reliable source, and I couldn't find any information on whether this case is still active, but I did think it was interesting enough to bring up. Another source said the oldest case was that of Elijah Craven, who disappeared from Oklahoma in 1902. His case is still listed on NamUs, so I assume it's still active, but I could be wrong. Marvin Clark has been missing for 94 years and would be over 160 years old today. So investigators aren't hoping to find him alive, but I will give some details that might help in his case. Marvin Elvin Clark disappeared from Tigard, Oregon on a Saturday, October 30th, 1926, when he was between 69 and 75 years old. He was headed to Portland, presumably either to visit his daughter or his doctor. Marvin had either white or gray hair and blue eyes. He was about 5 feet 8 inches tall and 170 pounds. He was paralyzed on his right side walked with a limp, and might have used a cane. He was last seen wearing a dark suit and hat. If you have any information about the disappearance of Marvin Clark, you can contact the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office at 503-988-4300. So that's all I have for you today on Marvin Clark. It kind of blows my mind that there are people out there who have been missing for this long. This case might be one of the oldest active ones, but there are a lot more inactive ones that are even older and will probably never be solved. I know that's kind of a depressing note to end on, but with newer technologies, I think there is hope that Marvin Clark's remains can be found and his descendants can have answers. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that bell. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.